Hello and welcome to Ops Area Working Group and the Combined Ops Area here at IETF 105 in, I'm told, Montreal. Bless you. Let's, uh, I'll kick this into full screen. This is an official IETF Working Group meeting. As such, the note well applies. Um, I assume many people in here have read this thoroughly, but if not, I will leave it up there for people to glance at and to be aware of how your contributions um, work here at the IETF. So do be aware this is a formal meeting and the note well applies. Thank you. I'm one of your co-hosts. I'm Joe Clark, uh, Tian Ren, my co-chair here. We are the uh, chairs for the Ops Area Working Group session. We will kick this off, and we have a fairly packed agenda, uh, though not as packed as some uh, in, in the past. The good news is we've seen a lot of mailing list uh, activity this time around. Uh, we've got some new uh, adopted documents as well, so we'll, we'll cover those. After the Ops Area Working Group, Portion, we will hand it over to our uh, area directors to do the um, uh, ops area portion of the meeting. Before we go any further, may I ask for a jabber scribe? A jabber scribe only, and I'm kind of looking at Joel Yeagley over here in the corner of my eye. Joel has agreed to do it. That's fantastic. In terms of minutes, um, we do have an ether pad. You see the link up there. I'm currently in it. Um, but what I did last time was I, uh, I just transcribed this off the YouTube um, thing, and that worked pretty well. So I'm going to say we'll do that again. However, we would appreciate that if anyone wants to note something down um, in one of these uh, sessions, in one of the presentations, please join the Etherpad and mark that uh, in there so we can capture it officially in the minutes. That would be fantastic. Uh, you see the link to the slides there. The slides are posted in our uh, agenda, or sorry, in our material section for this meeting, um, and they are in the order that they will be presented. We have four remote presentations this time. My, the most I've ever had is zero remote presentations, so this is substantially more. Um, we'll see how that goes. Uh, they've all been notified. We've worked with Meet Echo. Um, so we will uh, will attempt to do the uh, remote presentations when they come up. Have people signed the blue sheets? I think they just came back up to the front. Um, if we need some blue sheet action, uh, Tian Ren will go and, and deliver that. Please make sure you sign so that we can always right size the room um, for uh, future meetings. Any questions? Uh, anything uh, with the agenda? Um, what we uh, are going to do is cover these documents where the status of our adopted documents are and then go into the uh, into the presentations. Okay, so where we're at right now, we have um, four. Uh, one just got adopted recently, four working group documents. Um, the TACAX draft is uh, gone through a round of IESG review. The authors have replied to most of the discusses, we are awaiting a uh, updated uh, revision of the TACAX draft. I'm told, I, I contacted the authors, they weren't able to do one prior to this meeting, however, they expect an update to address the discusses as have gone out on the mailing list um, in the next two weeks. So we will expect to see an update then. Um, uh, we recently adopted the Network Telemetry Framework on draft. That has become a, a working group document. That's been presented here a couple of times. Uh, the secure um, device initialization that Warren uh, and others have uh, written, that was recently adopted. Um, that has got some uh, uh, good initial feedback and it might be in a, a fairly stable state. So uh, we would encourage all of you to read all of these drafts and comment on the mailing list. And finally, just last night, I think, uh, the TACAX uh, Yang module draft became, uh, 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 was switched over. And this is um, a complement to the radius uh, uh, portion of the IETF system module to be able to configure TACAX server parameters. Um, and that will be presented, uh, the updates of that, and some open issues and, and requests for feedback from the working group will be presented this morning. Questions on that? So as I mentioned, we've got uh, 10 
um, I believe 10, uh, maybe only nine presentations, nine presentations, thank you, Tanner, um, that we'll be going through today. If there are no agenda bashers, uh, we will kick things off. All right, Bo. I'm here to give some updates about uh, draft ITF uh, tackles young. Thank you. So this is, uh, as the chair said, it's just a, a zero uh, working group draft. And the older, the older change uh, uh, right now is uh, for right now, the Tacos Young draft is only contains the uh, Tacos Plus. Oh, here. Uh, it's on, uh, uh, Bo, can you, uh, can you yes. Uh, yeah, just a little closer so people can hear. Okay. So right now, the Tacos Plus only contains the uh, Tacos uh, client parameters here. It, uh, the tree structure of the Tacos Plus Young right now for this version. And uh, this uh, version, we uh, address the comments from the mailing list. And now, uh, like, the, like the source uh, interface and the VIF interface, right now, uh, this is the edit since last meeting. Uh, for now, uh, there's still some issues here. The first one is the downref tackles protocol. It's now, as the chair said, it's under the IESG. And, but it, the tackles pro protocol right now is uh, information mod, uh, draft uh, and will be published as an uh, information of received. So uh, our draft uh, is de dependent on this protocol. So. Uh, we see the comment from the mailing list that from Elliot, he proposed to discuss it in the working group. So uh, he, he, he said that it, we should be, that the AD knows that and should approve this. It's okay. Then the next one. Can, can I uh, just real quick on, on this, uh, Ignis okay. um, Warren, um, do you see any issues in insofar as this draft configures the server parameters for TACX if this is a down ref um, as, a, as all Yang modules that I've seen have been standard documents or standards mm -hmm. track documents. So would this be a, an issue? Ignis Bogdonis. Probably not. Uh, the fact is that uh, most of the modules are defined for the standard tracks protocols and attack access informational. So that is the source of this. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't see a problem as such. Thanks. Uh, the next, the next issue is the also from Elliot that since the working group may have the plan to define the uh, TACOS++ plus plus, like uh, TLS extension. So maybe that uh, extension will affair, affect the, the whole uh, the TACOS uh, young model structure. So here we uh, think there could be two uh, options here because one is that uh, from the chair that uh, Joe proposed to will be do another augmentation or next release of this draft to address the TLS uh, extension later. And the other uh, choice is uh, the we can leave uh, transport choice for flexibility in the young model. So I'd like to hear uh, what the working group think about this. Feedback on, on this item? Uh, 
right now the document that is being uh, in in IG relation is about TACAX. The work on the, what is beyond the TACAX with different transports uh, and extensions, that's, I would say it's not chattered or is not happening. That was an agreement that the working group first uh, pushes the TACAX, the TACAX through and only then the new work uh, with the new item starts. And now, uh, are you certain that uh, the way how you model the, the TLS extensions for that will be mm -hmm. what the working group wants to see from a transport perspective for the new TACACs or for, for extended TACACs? This seems a little bit kind of uh, timing-wise premature. Okay. Uh, I'm not saying that this is a wrong uh, way to do things, but uh, uh, in my view, the work on the follow-up of a TACAX protocol should happen first and then the modeling. Okay. Um, I, speaking as just a contributor, I agree. I, I think the, it's, it is, the, seems premature. I would, I would just say when that work happens, as that work evolves, that might lead to an augmentation um, okay. down the road. Okay, thanks. Uh, the, the other issue is also from Eben. He, Eben actually uh, proposed this uh, comment uh, at the first, the beginning of this draft, Young, because I think uh, right now the system model already defined the, the like how to use the uh, local authentication and together with radius and tech hooks, uh, no, not include tech hooks, but right, we propose the tech hooks, uh, tech hooks plus young model. So this should be also be considered to be uh, integrated into system young model. So right now, uh, although we already defined the tech hooks client, but uh, we still need to define the system authentication uh, extension to include the TACUS authentication method in it. So for now, uh, we, we, we don't have the think out uh, solution to address that. Uh, I think it needs to be uh, uh, a draft to address this, like a system send a triple A draft to do another augmentation because uh, I think there's also a comment from Radius uh, extension working group. They, they don't uh, like the system triple A, just include the TechOx Plus uh, authentication. They, they, they want to have a whole, if, if it's a triple A, a system triple A draft. Uh, but I also think maybe we can add a section to give example for like what will the system authentication would be like if uh, the Tacos Plus uh, would be added into it. So right now I, I don't have an uh, answer for that. So I think it belongs to Opera's area. So I, I, I like to hear the ADs. Uh, well, my thinking for this is uh, this is a rather simple change. Uh, do it here and, uh, well, as you call it, an example section. Going uh, in that mode way and publishing a draft which changes one line there, first thing it will take three ITF cycles, and that will result in probably over engineered system. This is something like a point fix. Mm -hmm. uh, especially given uh, the discussions about the versioning and changes of, of the models themselves uh, and possibly taking them out at some point of time away from an RFC publishing process. This seems to be a more practical way. So do it here, inform mm -hmm. that mod. Okay. Uh, they own uh, the system document. Yeah. But uh, it seems to be more practical that this is solved here. It will simply be faster. Okay. So I would choose that. The second one, okay. Uh, I also uh, had the comment from the John Hersley. He he he's, he said that the current tackles uh, uh, counter include the uh, not 
include the connection opens count, but uh, for like single connection case, then the tackles connection may be more than one uh, session. So maybe we can add a uh, sessions count. So I also uh, like to hear more comments from the working group. So can someone? Oh, I, I think it's a like detailed just, one. I will. Yeah, just speaking as a contributor, I think that makes sense. I mm. would, yeah, sessions counter makes sense to me at least. Okay, I will add this one to the uh, update draft. So that's all the uh, issues related to this uh, draft right now. So I will resolve the comments from, because John Hasley uh, proposed a more editorial and also some technical drafts uh, comments from. So I will, uh, next up, I will resolve these comments and together with uh, this issued uh, proposed. So I like to hear more uh, comments and suggestions from the working group. So that's all for this. Thanks. Um, I, I would say uh, we'd all like to hear more uh, comments as well, but it sounds like you have another action mm -hmm. to uh, at least handle the initial authentication piece as an augmentation here, mm -hmm. uh, where whether or not another draft about a more fleshed out AAA happens that could be proposed, but it uh, seems like that's another piece before we can we can keep progressing this. Okay, I will keep on on that. So, I oh, any other questions on TACX plus Yang module uh, module? Okay. I th uh, oh. Do we have any time? So Ignis uh, has asked, do we have any timeline when? I guess um, to, to you, the, the uh, primary editor slash author, um, mm -hmm. what do you think your ETA is on the changes that you want to make? Oh, I will, within the two weeks, I will update a new one. So within two weeks. I, I think um, after that, it, it feels like it's it's getting to it, it seems like a fairly straightforward yang module reads that way to me we've taken out some of the triple a stuff um I, I think we would be ready to to move to last call unless there are any blocking issues that come up on the list i think that's one of us. in fact that was my question it's not about when to publish the next version but when you believe that you have addressed the community comments and socialize that with the user base and then you will think that this will be done so in a sense, when this model can be considered stable and shipping? Uh, I think right now our uh, product already support this in our, so I think it's, uh, and also we take in account of uh, uh, other vendors comments like from Cisco and I think it's quite stable. Oh, okay. another. Yep. Uh, I think this is. Uh, so this draft is about SD1 service delivering uh, model. And right now it's uh, uh, the first portion of in the video one. Ah, and so I just on. give a brief in, uh, description of what is SD1 service model is. So it's. Uh, this uh, SD-WAN service is a connected connection service will be offered between one, uh, two or more uh, sites across. Uh, this is all customer sites and could be used uh, one or more on the lay networks. And what this model for, uh, we think the, it's just for the service, service provider uh, scenario and that this model is used for service providers, service orchestrator to dynamically create, modify the SD1 service components. The components could be like add a new site or add a new uh, VPN connection between the sites and also add some uh, applica application policy uh, component. So uh, since uh, last IETF meeting, we have uh, such changes. And first, we have a new co-author, 
uh, Charles Echo, uh, Charles uh, is uh, chairing the MEF uh, application committee, and SD1 project is under his lead. So uh, he's uh, very familiar with SD1 uh, service definition. So we, uh, with his help, we make the uh, the SD1 MEF SD1 project alignment with this draft. We added the MEF uh, related references. Now MEF has already published its 70 draft specification about SD1 service attributes. And we also uh, add the terminology comparison because in that way, uh, our draft is more, uh, will be more easily to understand by the ITF tr uh, traditions. So this is the main uh, changes. And we, we also uh, made uh, the whole editorial change, the entire draft to be better aligned with math project and readability. And besides all this, we also uh, highlight this IC uh, SD1 application based policy service since uh, SD1 is it's quite different with the traditional L2 VPN and L3 VPN. It has uh, application based multipass selection feature. So uh, there is a lot of policy related with this multipass selection policy. So this is the uh, main changes. And we also add uh, uh, a section to to high, uh, elaborate the what's the difference with the o OSE draft, it's proposed in RTGWG. So that's uh, the, the overall changes. And for the OSE model difference, uh, here is uh, the major difference. The major difference is uh, uh, our SD1 service model, which is a quite high high level interface to the customer, we uh, it's upon the user's request, service will do some infrastructure uh, service like sites, uh, connection, and also application policy. This is uh, it's a very high level one. Uh, for the for this model, uh, it will not be aware of any. Uh, like real underlay resources here. But for OSE model, the assumption is quite different. They, they feel that uh, SD1 infrastructure service is just within their uh, vendor domain, uh, SD1 manager's uh, scope. So they don't want to touch anything uh, about the site VPN part. They just want to do the OSE gateway service between the two domains. So right now they have the OSE gateway service model and they also, but they also have a pass service uh, very similar with SD1, uh, our model with application policy, but um, they just touch the application SLA based policy. That's because uh, because Across domains, inter-domains, they, they, they need to make the uh, different domains have the consistent policy. In that way, the SLA can be guaranteed uh, across the domains. So this is a major difference with the OIC draft. So now uh, I think- My question uh, is, do, mm -hmm. uh, do, do uh, both of you agree with the difference? The, the two model, do you agree with the difference? Uh, yes, I'm part of the other draft author. So we, but okay. the, 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 this draft has two uh, components. Um, so it can easily be understandable. Okay, thank you. And for right now, I think there, uh, the draft open this, uh, issue may be the first. Uh, we'll think uh, whether, uh, because right now, Charles is already the co-author of this draft. So we, we'd like to hear uh, whether the working group think this is uh, enough for the, the math working uh, project alignment. So we'd like to hear whether 
because in that way we can update the draft. So Charles can propose the changes to the MAP community to ask the comment. So I, I think uh, in this way we can make the a better alignment with the two standard edition. Yeah, uh, uh, Charles Eckel. So, um, you know, I have been working with within MEF. They're aware of this work that's going on. The one thing that makes it a little bit uh, tricky is, you know, MEF is more of a, a closed membership based organization, right? So a lot of things that happen in MEF are uh, by default um, private to the members. And it's, you can make effort to share things like not just via liaison, but there's other mechanisms too. So, but the, you know, so doing the work within IETF and then coordinating back to MEF just makes things easier because in IETF everything's, you know, open kind of by default. So um, in terms of liaison though, or, or working with MEF, um, are we comfortable with just sort of this informal, you know, I'm working in both. I think there, there's other people who are, would be working on, on, you know, in both communities. Or do we need something more formal? You know, that's kind of the question here. Ignaz Bogdan, this is actually a question, Charles, to you. Uh, draft wood is coming from ONUG side. How much of the coordination is happening between ONUG and MEF on the requirement side? So I'd say, you know, that, that's, that's evolving. Uh, I, I'm not active in ONUG, but my understanding of the history is that MEF and ONUG have not been able to work together very well. Um, them both coming into IETF with drafts has kind of helped force some uh, inner working. Uh, it, it's not a, a, a done deal, but one of the things that looks quite likely now is that both will be worked on within MEF, because if you look at the overall MEF architecture, there's a lot of the first draft that we're doing now is from a subscriber to a service provider, but there's also within MEF service provider to service provider interfaces, which is very similar to what a vendor to another vendor would look like, which is what the OSE draft is doing. So mm -hmm. MEF just hasn't gotten to that yet. It's not that they don't plan on doing that. So it would fit very nicely into the overall MEF architecture. And I think MEF and ONUG seem to be, they're still discussing, but it seems more promising that they will work together on that and perhaps by both being in that um, to be determined, but yeah. So I think for uh, uh, the OSE uh, sd one draft, I think uh, in, in and later on in the future, we, we should align the terminology of the two drafts. I will relate the, the working group's comments to, to Steve because he's not here at this time at IETF. So, and I also propose using like grouping statement on the component, uh, model component to allow reuse like the site VPN application policy grouping. So in that way, uh, maybe th this two dropped will not have too much overlap with the modeling. So that's, so I like to hear the working groups and. Um, thoughts on, on this. I, before, or if anyone is gonna come to the mic, a question, um, maybe you know, maybe you don't, what, is the uh, routing working group's thoughts on this uh, on uh, on I this on their draft? Is that is that going to be progressing forward? Um, what is their intent with that work? Uh, I think from the medalist, uh, Tian asked the, this question to ah. Steve, but Steve think uh, there's because they thinks they rely on the routing uh, areas expertise on the like interdomain, like different options configuration. So he, he prefers to RTGWG, but uh, I, I, I don't uh, tell him further about what's our, like this, our SD1 model is if it's, a, we'll be doing work here. So I like to hear maybe we can like uh, 
a presentation, pre doing some presentation or uh, getting comments from both working group and to work together. Um, yeah, I, I, I would like to see, personally see um, as a chair more of the discussion, where, where does it make most sense for this work to happen? Yeah. Where do we have the expertise? Because it sounds like the coordination with the other SDOs is, is, is useful, yes. um, especially bringing parties together here at the ITF, but where do we have the most likely chance of making this work successful? Yeah, okay. Uh, uh, actually, for OSE Young Model job, the actually work is uh, progressing. Right now, we didn't do too much update besides the terminology alignment. Uh, so uh, from also point of view, I, we, don't, we don't have a strong opinion. Uh, for this job, uh, where, uh, we, which working will be the right place to do this? We leave this to the chair uh, to decide this. Uh, SD1 itself is not uh, a technology component. It's it's a mix of, of separate technologies uh, mm -hmm. bundled into something like a product. And ITF doesn't work on that. ITF works on uh, on specific subcomponents of this mm -hmm. based on a guidance coming from ONUC, from MEF, from, from some other uh, entities in the industry. Um, therefore, with this, uh, for me personally, it's a question whether we understand the requirements of what need what needs to go into the modeling here. Uh, the other important aspect is that uh, even if we are talking here about a service model, uh, the service model eventually has interfaces to the technology-specific models, and that is where the biggest gaps are at this time. If we are looking into the security side, uh, the situation of modeling there is, uh, is quite sad. Uh, if we're looking into routing side, that situation is quite good. But again, in order to practically be able to use this divan as a service, those components need to combine. Therefore, and I'm just now thinking aloud, uh, the service modeling probably uh, would have more experience if that is done outside of the ITF. Uh, Onuko Mev probably. Uh, and ITF here in this case is an owner of uh, Young as a modeling language and the guidance of how that should be done. The technology specific components, which are not in scope of those drafts, which are happening, the, the, there are some documents elsewhere, um, probably are within the scope of ITF and uh, not in OPS AWG, but in uh, the say, specific working groups focusing on the technology. Routing, uh, tunneling, IP second, things like that. Yeah. Um, and this question is raised from a pr practicality perspective. Uh, yes, SD-WAN is fashionable uh, buzzword these days, and therefore it, it attracts attention in ITF. The question is whether ITF has sufficient words to say uh, for, for the community of the users that. Let's look re realistically, SD-WAN is not being standardized uh, in ITF, and another thing, as divan is not something to standardize. This is a collection of technology components, and that work is done uh, outside of ITF. I think this is a requirement from MAF, and MAF has already defined the service, and we just uh, uh, ITF just, we just help uh, MAF to to design the the young data model. And that is perfectly fine if this is done in a context that ITF is the source of guidance on how to design the thing. If we, if we are certain that we have enough of the requirements and that model will eventually match of what they expect and will be usable, yes, fine, let's do that. Uh, otherwise, if this is a situation that ITF is trying to tell uh, the operations community on how this should be done and operated, probably it's not the right way of doing it. So, so I think the answer is um, we are not going to uh, describe the requirement um, uh, uh, or define the requirement in ITF. We just uh, use the requirement uh, uh, from math, right? So. Uh, 
Charles Eckel. Um, MEF 70, uh, the doc that's already referenced here, that, that is the requirements for SD-WAN. Now, that's, uh, MEF has decided that they've you know, made it publicly known that they're doing a phased approach. There's already a phase two, which is going to add more capabilities kind of more details into the requirements and, and, and the specification of the service. Um, there's almost certainly going to be a phase three rather than wait and try to get everything. MEF wanted to bring this to, you know, to market and make it public as soon as possible. So they've decided to, to take a phased approach. So the, these requirements are going to continue to um, expand, I guess. Um, so what our current approach was, yeah, let's just reference the publicly available specifications um, and make it an IETF draft. Otherwise, um, we could do the Yang modeling work within MEF, but then we would just really rely on IETF expertise to not only review and comment on it, but help us maintain alignment so that people that try to use the MEF service models and tie it to you know the technology and the underlays that are actually used that 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 could be a straightforward type of thing. So, yeah. you know, MEF would need help with that. Because what I've seen with MEF models in the past is they kind of sit out on their own and it's hard to figure out how to make use of any IETF models in combination with them. Yeah, yeah, I see this is a good cooperation between MEF and the IETF. Yes. So what's your so opinion? That, that needs us? to happen, but how best to do that, whether to do the Yang models here or in MEF, I, I honestly don't know. I, I just want to try to get the two groups to, to cooperate more. And, and the one thing that makes me think IETF is better is that working on these things in the open in IETF, again, is the default. Whereas in MEF, I've been trying to make MEF more open and, and put out early versions of things, and it's possible to do that. It just, it's a little bit more painful. And there will be some lag yeah. between when the working group within MEF uh, they're, they're, they'll, they'll kind of bless it or like periodic versions of, of the document to share publicly. Yeah, yes, I understand. I just uh, adjust, try to adjust Ignas' question. Uh, Ignas Bogdanis, and well, this is one of the worrying aspects from my side. Uh, Charles, you say periodically. Uh, does this mean that this this set of drafts right now focuses on phase one and nothing more? And uh, once they have the requirement, if they are working on the requirements for phase two, that will be a se separate model, and not just iterative and uh, endless work on uh, this model here. Um, yeah, so, so as I mentioned, there is already a phase two document. It's going to be MEF 70.1. It's already started, and there will almost certainly be a MEF 70.2. That's just the way MEF, rather than do biz versions, that's the way MEF does it. Only this time they intentionally said, specify just, you know, like an MVP type of thing for SD-WAN. That's MEF 70, knowing up front that they would immediately start a MEF 70.1. And that's the way they're working on this. So it'll continue to... Um, add additional SD-WAN related, you know, service functionality into it. Not only that, but to start to work on other interfaces. Just This is just one interface, as I mentioned. This is the interface between a customer and a subscriber, right? There are going to be, uh, sorry, a, a customer and a service provider. There will be interfaces for service provider to service provider, and then also north-south interfaces within a, a service provider where hopefully we'll be able to leverage a lot of IETF uh, existing Yang models. So basically, ship phase one, and then we'll have other things. Yep. Okay. Uh, this is from Huawei. Just uh, uh, add something here. Actually, I think the collaboration between MEF and IETF should be encouraged. We already you know, uh, do this. Actually, besides uh, uh, Charles getting involved and we also have our colleague Nina Dunba actually get engaged in this SD1 activity in MEF. We have to coordinate between MEF and ITF. And my colleague Nick Uber also, you know, keep track of this MEF progress to make sure online. So I think it also we also hear there's some requests from MEF. They really want to see how to map, a, you know, surface level definition into the online technology. So they look into sound in the face of all traders. So they try to, uh, you know, uh, want to get help from the IETF. So, so that's why we think this is something we should, uh, you know, um, keep on to collaborate with MEF. 
Thank you. Um, thanks. We're, we're going to have to uh, take, I, I think we should keep having, ha have this discussion and ask the pointed question on the list because we are running out of time okay. as to what, um, what is this work interesting here? And I'll, I'll take an action to start that discussion on the list so we can capture some more of these comments. Okay. So Okay. Is there uh, uh, well, is there any interest in in this room then of of taking up this work of continuing this work uh, for this model um, in Ops AWG? Uh, one, two, a few hands. Well, more hands keep going. I guess maybe if I wait long enough. Um, okay. Um, do people think this document is ready for adoption then by the working group in its current state? Less hands, but not zero. Um, I think we'll take it to the list and see what, uh, what the list thinks. Um, we definitely want to hear more comments, um, but uh, we're going to have to move on. Thank you, Bill. Okay. Well, thank you. I've, I've just been notified that uh, we have a little bit more time from Warren. Uh, our next presentation will be uh, remote. Um, so I will ask Oscar, are you there? Yeah, yeah. I'm here. Can you hear me properly? Uh, we can hear you perfectly. Can you hear us? Yes, I've, I've been hearing you all the time. So yesterday I had also a good experience with routine working group. So it seems this remote presentation works good. And even okay. I can see the guys in the room now. Okay. Can you, uh, yesterday one couldn't interrupt a remote presentation. So uh, hopefully uh, open that. But it sounds like we can talk back and forth. Great. So uh, all, your, uh, all you. Okay. So I'm going to do a presentation today of the Layer 3 VPN network model that we submitted the first version in May and recently we submitted a second version. It is an initiative by a bunch of operators who we are trying to, we were trying to implement the automation of layer 3 VPNs and we took as a starting point the layer 3 SM and uh, we found uh, some things to implement it. so this is why we were uh, pushing for this uh, network model so um, next slide please so we're going to see why do we need a new network model uh, what uh, have we found missing so far in the l 3 SM which are the approaches that we can follow to do this work. Some modifications, I think I don't, I'm not going to enter into the modifications really in detail. You have the draft to, uh, and the document and the young model to go through them if needed and just focus on the open issues and get more feedback from the community. So next slide, please. <clears throat> yeah, so first of all, why do we need a, a, a new model? Okay, so the, there is currently a VPN service model, the L3SM, and it's a very good model. And we do think that the, it is a, a good model to be used in the communication between the customer and the network operator. So we believe that for that kind of communication, it's a, it's ideal. Okay, uh, however, uh, the, uh, as it is always seen from the customer point of view, uh, it does not enter uh, and it should not enter into some parametrization of the network resources. Uh, also does not enter into, for example, identifying really the, the PE or the real port that we are uh, using in the, in the operator's network. <clears throat> so this is why uh, when implementing it, to be used towards uh, our automation tools, call it, uh, some people call it SDN controller, some people call it network orchestration. There are uh, several ways of using it. In the just in yesterday's presentation in, in Rudin Working Group, uh, we explained the different architectural uh, options or how the model fit in the different architectural options but basically this is the or, or this model would be the the piece between the service orchestration and the network orchestration 
part okay so it's once you have received the request from the customer and then you are able to do select which are the real endpoints from where the service is gonna be used and uh, you need to define the resources then model is used for that uh, part okay and this is where we are implementing it in uh, in telefonica and also other operators plan to implement it in that part okay so please next slide please uh, so for, uh, here I'm going to just describe very briefly <clears throat> some scenarios where the, the that there were some gaps with uh, L3SM. So for example, one of them is the the specific PE identification points. Also details about the bidders. I, we think that the keys are the the bidders that are the physical connections to the to the PEs. So specify which is the encapsulation. So in our use cases, uh, we have a wide variety of L3 VPNs starting with uh, different uh, kinds of encapsulations. So we also need to be able to inform about which are the list of available beers per site. So for us, even for both for inventory and for management purposes, it is, it is needed. Also, we have found the uh, use cases in our network uh, where the far end uh, is remote, so we need a pseudo wire stitching to the L3 VPN. Also, we need to cover uh, use cases uh, uh, with multiple domains, so that is, we need to split the layer 3 VPN into several domains, so uh, we need to orchestrate these resources in different domains. And uh, also related to this multi-domain, uh, be able to configure what we call the VPN nodes, which would be like an abstraction of the of the BRF. So just taking into account that here we are not entering into device configuration. Okay, we are describing here the service as a whole in the in the network. Okay, and uh, also we found that the, there are room for some more uh, routing protocols between C and and P. Okay, so please uh, next slide. So I just want to discuss one of the, the which is the approach that we can do. So we had a, or our original approach in the 00, 0 version was okay, go for the augment approach. Okay, let's take the L3SM and extend it to uh, with what we found missing. Okay, uh, but then we realized that there are a lot of uh, things from the service model, the customer service model that we no longer needed. They were used in the service orchestration phase to make them some decisions. And then, okay, once those decisions are made, we don't uh, uh, we don't need them. So uh, then is why we think that there is a better. And uh, when we requested for feedback in the mailing list, people said, okay, the prune and strength approach might be better. So it's okay. Start with L3SM, remove what is not needed, keep everything related to the service that we need to maintain it to to go put down and uh, then augment whatever is uh, is needed. And we know that this might take a long time. This might take more discussions in in IETF. Don't forget that L3SM was even a working group itself. So we know it's a, it might take some time. But I think uh, as the kind of augmentations and uh, won't be hopefully not too much, I think we can, uh, uh, this is a, a valid approach and just in the pruning process we need to define uh, what uh, what do we need to keep. Yesterday there was some suggestion of keeping some information just as optional and uh, not mandatory to push it down. Okay, so next slide please. Uh, so, with the pronoun extent approach, we can we have tried to preserve as much as possible the L3SM structure. So, within the L3NM, we will have the VPN service and the site with the list of bidders and uh, the VPN uh, inside the VPN service and uh, add some uh, profiles associated to uh, these VPN nodes. So. And uh, not going to enter into much more details for that. Uh, we can discuss it on, on the list. Okay, so please, next slide. So, uh, how does it map to the network deployment? So, uh, basically, what we have in our network is a, is a collection of PEs, and in that collection of PEs is where we will say, okay, we will associate VPNs nodes 
two uh, piece and the beaters will be the physical ports that connect to the piece and these uh, beaters can uh, have uh, several connections over them and these connections to the to the site to the customers are the uh, site network access so this is how uh, it relates so of course this is a simple uh, <laughs> Uh, more complex scenarios uh, where the connection between the the real customer side and the PE goes through a set of switches and where you do uh, some uh, different levels of <coughs> encapsulations or as we mentioned earlier it's a pseudo wire to that part connection but basically this is the the main the main concepts okay so uh, just we keep the site as a logical structure say okay this is our some remote location will be connected here the beater is the so I want them to do detail. This is just the, the structure of the, of the model, and we added uh, is in uh, the uh, orange color is what we added to the model. So that I'm not going to into detail. I prefer receiving feedback on you. So this slide, please. Also here, these are some of the extensions that we did here. So for example, for the VPN service, uh, we added some uh, files, which are the important profiles, the ones that will be associated to, to PRF. So this is where we can put really the, the resources. Uh, so for example, the RTs, RTs. So for example, we have observed in many services in Telefonica, uh, that the same RTR is used uh, in all the locations. So then we can uh, uh, we can put it here in this profile and associate it to a VPN node. So then uh, we do this uh, uh, allocation on the uh, on the OSS level and we pass it to the to the model and then this is then further taken down to that device model. Also, for example, in the in the site, what we have uh, uh, for the for the site is the the bidders. So this is the list of bidders that are associated to that site. Okay. So for example, for a that for some customer, okay, you are using this specific uh, bidder, and uh, in the site network access, you have the pointer to that. Uh, to that bidder. Okay, so if you go to the next slide, please, uh, just then I'm gonna go very quickly. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so here we keep, uh, in, in GitHub, we have a <coughs> list of the open issues uh, that people have identified in the mailing list. So we will have taken is everything that was on the mailing list, take it out open it as an issue in GitHub just to be able to to track it. And now we have already solved two of these three issues. And we still have some uh, some open open points. So for example, uh, how to link the network service young model with other modules. For example, the topology. I am assuming that uh, the network orchestration or network controller can expose a topology and this topology uh, contains the PE. So maybe it's easier that uh, we can just do a leaf ref from the uh, network service model to those nodes uh, in the topology. For traffic engineering, there is already an initiative in, in TIAS to map the service to the uh, to the set of tunnels that uh, might compose it. So I think uh, if we go for this approach, we need to link with that work. And also the composed VPNs, which goes for more complex uh, multi-operator VPN scenarios. So, so far we have received uh, good feedback on the mailing list from uh, operators and uh, people that potentially can, can implement it. Uh, we have a set of vendors that are uh, on, have their implementations of going of this model so we can uh, take it to to the network so we think that this is a topic that it is in a scope 
of the ITF and uh, we'd like to uh, continue working on, on it and uh, we plan to post an, a new version um, just soon, just fixing some uh, some bugs and uh, keep collecting uh, more and we'd like to hear also from, from you uh, how to move forward uh, this this work and if it's interesting uh, for the community so thank you very much thanks oscar um comments quickly on uh, on this uh, the l3 network model hi oscar this is binocles so thanks for this work it's always great whenever we have operators coming and providing feedback on the service models and yes sometimes there are iteration on service models so my only open question is, so uh, those were also operators who came and creating a service model, the first one, and there were also from Orange and KDI and Verizon. Did you get their feedback on uh, what you're proposing here? Uh, yes, and when I got the feedback, is what that their intention uh, was aimed at creating the service for the customer of the, uh, from the, customer point of view so so i think their focus was not exactly the same as the uh, as the model so it was like in a higher level so i think that the uses of these models are at different steps in the chain within an operator thank you Oscar. so i have a, a question for the room um does, uh, do people feel that this work is valuable to do here in Ops AWG? Substantial number of hands um, went up. Um, okay, I, I think Oscar, uh, you had a, you, you gave yourself an action item to uh, update. You, you're going to update this draft uh, with some of the open issues. I was looking at the, at your GitHub. You've got a, a few of them there. Um, I think uh, do that, and then we can uh, decide to progress this forward. It sounds like there's enough interest in the working group here, and we'll double check on the list to keep this work moving forward in Ops AWG. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Oscar. Um, and from my first remote presentation, that went surprisingly well. So clearly the next three are going to be disasters. Yes, but, <laughs> but I hope that next time I'll be in Singapore so I can make it on site. <laughs> As do we. Uh, okay, um, Chinwu, you're up. Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Chinwu. I'm here to discuss uh, the framework uh, for automate uh, uh, service and uh, network uh, management with Yang. Actually, uh, this topic, actually, we set up the side meeting to discuss this, so we will bring some feedback. So this is also a list. We actually work together with many operators on this work. So, uh, go back to the goal and the motivation. We think uh, right now ITF de develop a, a huge amount of young data model, how this model can put it together, integrate together in the same name space. So this is something hasn't been documented anywhere. And uh, so uh, so the, the goal of this draft actually try to, you know, come up with this young model architecture uh, for service management and network management. and, and uh, what we really like, like to do is come up with this common functionality and a framework uh, to help to build this uh, fully young based system. And uh, in addition, we want to provide a guideline how to, you know, uh, to, to, to put the young model at a different layer together to uh, deliver a service and uh, also for this kind of service enforcement. But uh, we cannot avoid the ocean. So really this work actually, uh, you know, focus on the young data model integration uh, at a different layer or in the same layer. So some of uh, work actually, we already uh, have some many needed discussion or we get feedback from some operator. Uh, we think uh, we want to, uh, you know, not, not uh, uh, put everything in this uh, draft. So first step actually, uh, whether we should list all the young, uh, young model defined in ITF or, uh, in this job, actually, th that's not our intention because uh, it's, uh, it's it's very challenging to enumerate all these young data model. Also, maybe we have other young model developed in other SDO. How to you know put all all, all, all these together? So it's not uh, reasonable. So we don't cover uh, first piece. The second is 
do we need, need to provide inventory uh, of the tools or mechanism? Uh, actually, uh, one example is uh, we have many OM uh, tools or mechanism, and uh, but we think uh, this is uh, not uh, the focus of this work. Uh, this work just focus on young data model integration. I think a tool chain is very important, but we can leave this out and uh, and to more focus on um, the young data model integration. Also, uh, you know, in the signing meeting, we really want to address is uh, gap, gap between the IETF young model and the uh, operator, uh, re really uh, operator requirements, actually. But we think uh, uh, put uh, this kind of gap adoption in this draft that's also not reasonable. So we leave this out. And uh, another comment actually from operator, the, the um, talk with us whether we can provide young data model re registration. We think uh, already IET uh, have young catalog effort. They actually can help uh, operator to uh, figure out how to select the model when they de deploy the service. So young catalog can be a good uh, tool uh, to address these kind of issues. So we leave this out. O also, uh, because uh, young data model, you know, many SDO do this. So integration uh, model in uh, across the SDO, actually, this is something very useful, I, I think, but we don't want to cover this. So status update, actually, we present this job in the last uh, IETF tier meeting in, in both ops area and the uh, routing area, and uh, solitary feedback from the uh, operator and the uh, implementer. And uh, we actually, uh, based on the OPSWG management uh, discussion, actually, uh, some comments raised by the Joe and, uh, and uh, some other uh, vendors, and uh, we try to address some of the, 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 the issue actually. So we make actually two uh, revision in the, in the previous revision, there were four actually, we tried to address the Joe's comments and other vendors' comments and um, to try to clarify uh, the module composition and a young catalog. And um, also we actually work, uh, we reach, reach out to the operator um, team actually, get a lot of feedback. The, all of them actually, many of them actually integrate, uh, interesting in how to integrate a young data model in the same namespace. So, so we added uh, several new co uh, co-author actually from, from operator actually. Uh, and uh, we also, you know, clarify the scope, try to make it more focused. Yeah, that's the change we made. And uh, a quick update for the side meeting. Actually, this side meeting actually organized on Tuesday morning and uh, and uh, uh, and uh, we invite many operator. Also, we uh, uh, socialize this uh, uh, side meeting through the mailing list, and uh, we make it public on the side meeting wiki page, uh, make it more official. So the goal is try to discuss the gap uh, uh, between the IETM model and uh, industry needs, and uh, see what is the right venue to discuss or address this gap. So this. Uh, uh, draft actually try to cover some of the pieces, try to address this gap, how to do the young data model integration. And uh, so we, uh, you know, work with China uh, Mobile uh, and also uh, Telefonica on, and for this, uh, we present the young data model uh, uh, framework and uh, also uh, China Mobile present the problem space and uh, the current status of young data model and and uh, Telefonica present uh, their use case and requirements. So we get a lot of discussion, and um, the uh, so here we listed the meeting material and minutes. You can take a look at, look at that. So the outcome actually, we we feel actually, you know, people agree that that's uh, there's a gap. Actually, this gap need to be addressed. So there's many way to address this. So we are actually approach AD to talk about that. There's Actually, we have many proposals. I think um, we may create the many list uh, to sort of the feedback from the operator community, also from the implementer or developer. Also, for this kind of young data model uh, integration framework, is very useful tools. And um, also, we, we should actually to figure out how to reach out to the operator community with many ways. So, uh, so one question from the author, uh, the design team, actually, uh, we we think uh, you know uh, we try to address uh, some of this gap. Actually, we think uh, this kind of uh, data model integration framework will, will be a good uh, uh, you know starting point to to figure out how how to address this. And uh, so we we 
want to ask working group whether it is the right working group to talk about this, whether it's useful to publish such kind of document. That's the, that's all. Thanks, Chen. Um, comments on, uh, on this draft? So, uh, personally, um, more as a, I guess, a contributor, um, I, I, I still, I, I saw your out of scope. When I read through it, there's still, you, you list a lot of the, the IETF Yang modules, how they fit together, what the capabilities currently are. I'm not sure how they, how that structure currently gets to some of the, the questions and the gaps. Um, so for me, it's how do we engage more operators? And Benoit came up and made the comment, it's great when we see operators putting forth what, what they want to see, but how, how are, is, is this work going to fill or, or help to, to bridge some of those gaps? Yeah, I, I think there's a many discussion on this uh, issue for we list the many young data model at a different level. So we try to address these. We think it will be used for use IETM model as an example to uh, to see how these model can put together. I, actually, some people may suggest move to the appendix, but we still think maybe there's some uh, you know we we can uh, you know make it more generic. Doesn't need to you know tie it to specific IETM defined model. Uh, this is something we can clean up actually, but we really want to target to the generic architecture to come up with this uh, common functionality framework. Yeah. Uh, Rob Wilton, Cisco. So I've not read the draft, or I've only seen read bits of it, so uh, I, I can't give detailed comments. But I think having a general architecture describing how um, services provisioned and use Yang models and the layering and that sort of thing, I think that's generally useful. I, I think. At an abstract level, that sort of information is handy and ex explain the life cycle and stuff. And I think that's the heart of what Dan Bogdanovich's talk in RTG WG was also getting to yesterday. Um, whether there should be any specifics about particular models and how they interact written into a draft that, that I'm not so sure about because I think that stuff probably needs to evolve quite quickly and by the time it goes through the specification process, it's, it's not so useful. I think that almost that needs to be on GitHub somewhere or something. That, that's the place where I think the uh, sort of running code side of this, which is why I regard that, the relationship between those models is probably more useful, maybe. So I don't, there's not a comment on this draft, but I, I would see trying to dis describe the abstract architecture as being the key piece for me. Thank you. Liang from China Mobile. Um, I think there are more coordination work than technical work for, for, for these thoughts um, of young model status. And I think it's quite useful to have a framework as a guideline if that can help operators understand more what model has been developing, what um, working group in, in, in such a status so that the operator can give more feedback to the community how and what we, sh what we could do to actually coordinate all this model to, to have a more end-to-end -end service type of, of, of methodology. Um, so I would have thought um, the framework would be helpful in terms of coordinate all these um, young models work happening in ACF. Uh, so Rob Wilson, yeah, I definitely agree with that previous comment about this being a coordination problem as well. Yeah, uh, just one information we want to share. Actually, we also, you know, receive a lot of positive feedback from many operators in this ITM meeting. Many people re may really not, uh, don't read this uh, draft, but they join the study meeting and they give a lot of uh, good feedback. They think this uh, kind of uh, framework is needed to help them to deploy the service. So I, I think um, it will be useful to have this, yeah. I, I think what at least I've heard he here, um, it might be useful to divorce some of the specific Yang modules and maybe talk to Dian and, and see what might be done at a higher level framework to sure. um, do some of the things Rob was mentioning about connect the dots and how one uses uh, Yang modules together. Yeah. More. Frank. Uh, one more thing, Frank Rockners. Before you jump to the framework, maybe it's useful to reverse the logic. Um, if you, I just scan through the document and 
for certain services, you seem to be doing that mapping exercise that goes across all these various layers. And then at the same time in your presentation set, you, you were saying that some of these things should be out of scope. So right now the document is a little bit of a mix, mixed bag of things between specifics that are not really done to the very level of granularity that you would need in order to get that actionable and implementable. And at the same time, you have this generic framework that you use or that you want to go and derive from these specific models. What I believe would be useful is to break this thing up and maybe initially focus on one, two, three initial use cases where you really do the mapping exercise and really nail it to the detail. And once you have that learning experience, then you can go and up level that into something that is more generic. Uh, if we're trying to do both things at the very same time, it might be that we're doing disservice to the generic framework as to the thing that you don't really spell out to the level of detail where it becomes actionable and implementable. Because the devil with this mapping exercise is in the detail. There's multiple layers of indirection and you can get it wrong at every single layer of indirection. And then most of these layers of indirection are non-deterministic uh, from an implementation perspective necessarily, right? So what do you choose? Which particular counters do you refer to? Uh, so I, I'd rather see the, the nitty gritty spelled out maybe in a different document uh, than while well, you're trying to go and lump everything into one big bag. Ignaz Bogdanas. Framework is good and is needed, but uh, you cannot deploy the framework. Uh, you also need a set of validated models that actually work together and do something of value to the operations. Uh, framework is a guidance, but uh, that guidance should also drive the work of uh, actually validating the things together. So I think that's similar to what Frank was explaining, probably from a slightly different angle. So both both of those works are needed, and what you're doing here is in the right direction, but this is not something that can be taken and, and used. Okay, we can keep uh, policy this document, try to make it more generic, yeah. Thanks, Jen. Next up, we have a lot of mud in your eye. Um, Elliot, and then uh, we'll have Dan after that on various mud topics. Good morning. All right, so um, let's see here. The first thing we'll talk about is the mud controller selection, and then we'll get into mud reporting. All right, so uh, just by way of review, um, when, uh, uh, when, a device, uh, when a device wants to be protected by manufacturer usage descriptions, it publishes a, uh, a MUD URL, uh, the MUD manager picks up a MUD file, and that MUD file contains a bunch of access control statements. And those access control statements can say things like, allow me to connect to a controller or my controller. Um, now, uh, it could also say things like, let me go to this domain, let me talk to the same manufacturer, uh, most of the other abstractions or, or classes, they, they can be filled in automatically by the MUD manager. But the controller cla uh, uh, class and my controller class requires, at least at the moment, some system administrator or network administrator input. Well, the network administrator might want some help in answering the question, who should be the controller for this particular device? There are two different classes. There's my controller and there's controller. My controller is... Uh, uh, it that does not require any class naming on the part of the manufacturer. It just says for this given MUD URL, um, the my my controller should uh, I should have access to my controller, and the administrator administrator can fill in that for controller. They name a class. And the benefit of naming a class is you can use that across many different um, device types. Um, so now the question then is, how do we provide a hint to uh, the uh, um, to the administrator as to what those controllers should be. So that's what this draft uh, starts to, to flesh out. Um, it's, so it's, this is for the controller, uh, uh, this is a controller driven approach. That is to say the controllers declare, I can be a controller for a particular type of device. 
Um, the controllers themselves are assumed to have MUD files in this context. And that means, by the way, at least at the moment, that they're assumed to have a single purpose. Um, they, uh, they, can, they can use an extension to declare this, um, which basically names the classes that they can control. And it's up to the admin to decide whether or not they like the idea of this controller having access uh, to, for this purpose. So that's pretty much the draft in a nutshell. Um, and so this is how it works. I can, you know, this guy says, I can control class brand.example.com slash homeowner. And these guys all say, forgive me for stepping outside the line for a moment. Um, uh, they all put in their things, essentially a permit statement that says, let me access this thing. So you have a nice rendezvous. And so that's, th this is uh, something that uh, we wanted to get around to in the initial version. It was probably just a bit much for the initial version of MUD. This is just a nice extension that ties a nice bow around uh, the automation process here. Now there are a couple of open questions. Okay, the first one is that the controller itself, as I mentioned, has to have a MUD file in MUD URL, meaning that the controller itself is not an application. This is something we'd like to fix, um, but at least on the MUD list, and I think we, this even got to the Ops Area Working Group list, um, this is um, still a pretty hard problem. And the second point is that manufacturers may want to advertise which devices can fill in these classes from their side. So if I go back to this picture here, it, rather than having this guy say, I can control these guys and I can be in this class, the other way to do this is to say, these guys can say, here are a list of controllers that can control me. Now, um, I can't say quite, uh, quite yet which one's the better approach to do this. Uh, I think we need a little implementation experience. We need to talk to some manufacturers. It could be that both are the right approach. One area I want to explore is whether we can get the model right such that it can be used in either case. However, I think that's going to be a little difficult. Um, but I think what I'd suggest is um, people read the draft. I don't think it's ready for working group adoption just yet. But I will be, I'm going to implement this in the next couple of months. It's pretty easy implementation um, when you do it from the controller side. It's really easy. I think Ranga there could probably do it in 20 minutes with, with his headphones on. Um, and uh, uh, to, give, to give you an idea, I mean, it's, I think it's very easy to implement. Um, and, but the only issue is you have to have some UI elements in there as well to say, yes, these are the things in sort of a drop down. Here are the guys who, who, who are able to be controllers for this device. Um, in some cases, if you're the only controller, you might just want to fill it in and say, I see this guy, is it okay when, when you do the initial approval? All right, so is there interest in this work? Anybody? People read this draft, interest? I see a couple of hands. Yep, a few hands have yeah. gone up. All right, so yeah, for the rest of you, read the draft. It's fun. I like doing stuff, fun stuff. Um, all right, uh, questions before I go on? Yeah, Tim Karinoki, I do have a question. Uh, just respect to, with, in general with MUD, right? Uh, so when I look at the RFC, uh, the RFC was, you know, really oriented towards, you know, the URL and, you know, how you get that stuff, right? And it made secondary uh, comments on a, what a control on a controller it gave a definition. But what I don't now I'm seeing more and more specifications about now I've got a reporting aspect, a controller, uh, whatever, right? And so I'm wondering if MUD is turning from a URL, in simple words, right, uh, to a system. Right where you have these controllers and stuff, and and so my concern is is that we've got some systemic or system aspects of this that uh, or framework I don't care, but but how all this kind of works together, controller works with a with an agent. We had the same thing in some other places that that I was actually looking at this work to see if if it made sense to extend the other work that had controllers and agents for IoT and and other management of devices into to utilize the MUD and incorporate it, but I didn't have the framework elements that that I that I could really understand. I could infer them, but I didn't see them. And so I was just wondering if there's a if we're going to move this from a URL to a to to more systemic uh, elements. Is there a, is there something that we need to produce for the uh, for the industry to to understand what what all the components of MUD is and how they interact. All right, thank you for the question. Um, I'll, I'm going to respond briefly uh, for, for, for time's sake. Um, 
If you look at the history, actually, of the RFC, if you go back into the tracker, there was a framework document, and we collapsed everything into that that mud uh, that mud RFC. Um, the mud consists of what I would say are three components, really: the URL, the description file, and um, the the its interpretation um, at the at the mud manager level. Um, what I would suggest is we have an offline conversation, though, about whether additional guidance is needed for industry. I'm always happy, believe me, I blather on. I'm always happy to, to, to provide whatever guidance we think industry needs in order to implement this. And from a systemic view, I was hoping that we have a reasonably systemic view in that document. If you're saying that we're missing, then I'd like to correct. Yeah, it's just that as we're as it seems like we're extending things, it's just trying to understand what the responsibilities of the various components are, right? You know, I, I think that was kind of missing, other than some short descriptions in the initial RFC. All right, let me come back to that because I have a question later on in in, in the discussion. Hi, I, I, I think I second the team's uh, opinion. Actually, I don't see the whole picture of how these IoT devices. Uh, you know, what is the life cycle, the whole IoT device management? We may need some framework to to, to see how, how it works, how Matt, Matt fit into this framework. It's not very clear to me, but I think very useful to have, have this kind of progress. I encourage your draft. <laughs> that is to say, please write one. Okay. So the next thing is a little different. Um, this is work that uh, Ranga uh, from NIST and I are working on. Um, and this was in response to uh, some industry interest. They said, well, okay, great. I have my MUD file. I have, uh, I have my MUD URL output. How do I know that the device is being treated appropriately within a given network? Um, now, if the title of this says reporting on fails. It could also be reporting on successes. I just want to highlight that my, you know, I tend to be a, a, a bit of a pathologist, so I always look at the fails in my head. Um, so the problem statement is here is exactly uh, what you see there, which is what happened, for, at least in my mind, what happened if uh, the device isn't getting uh, uh, the, the access that it needs, even though it's putting out the MUD URL and a MUD manager is interpreting it. All right, now, so we have an initial version of a draft, um, which is draft leader ops area group a mud reporter. Um, so imagine, roughly speaking, what's reported is, uh, um, think of ARF. So you got Murray in the back of the room there, um, all the way in the back, actually, uh, who did this thing called ARF, which is a reporting mechanism on uh, how DMARC uh, is being used, for instance, to uh, reject or quarantine email. Well, the same sort of concept applies with mud. You've deployed this MUD URL. You've deployed this device. Now, what happens? You know, is it is it is it acting? Um, uh, is is it being used appropriately? Is the device getting the access it needs? And within a deployment, if you have multiple multiple devices, are some of them getting the access they need? Are some of them not getting the access they need? And what information does the manufacturer need in order to determine a couple of questions? What are those questions? Okay. Number one is maybe the, is the mud file wrong? Like maybe he's maybe they've underspecified permissions in the mud file, and so all of a sudden you're seeing these rejections. Is the device hacked? Maybe the mud file's right. The network management system is operating exactly as it should be operating, but the device has been hacked and is trying to go in different directions. Um, which, by the way, is one of the the the, the design goals of mud is to actually spot that. Um, is there a problem with the MUD manager where it's not filling out the abstractions correctly? Um, is it a problem with, say, domain lookups? If you have, a, if you're saying, please permit access to domain such and such, is the resolution occurring such uh, differently between the device and the policy enforcement point such that the device is being blocked even though uh, the domain maps to a particular uh, to that IP address? So these are some of the problems that you could. Uh, uh, crop up in, 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 in a mod implementation. Um, so um, our model needs to support a little bit of this. Now, this is initial draft. To give you how, an idea how initial, just in the span of four days, Ranga went and implemented about 80% of it. Um, actually, he went and implemented about 80% of it in two days. Um, 
And um, in, those, in, in those two days, probably the draft has changed about 20% in terms of the model. So maybe even a little bit more. So it's really, really actively being developed, um, but it also leads to a couple of questions, right? Um, and the biggest issue I wanna highlight is that there are privacy concerns here. So the MUD manager starts reporting this stuff. Let's say it's reporting it to the manufacturer. All of a sudden, you know, what information is the manufacturing is the manufacturer getting that he were, that that they otherwise wouldn't get? And is that some, can we establish an appropriate permissions model such that this reporting model is actually useful? So this is the part where I say, Warren, pay attention. <laughs> Right, because you're very focused on privacy issues, so I want to. Uh, this is where we need a lot of guidance. We might want to bring this draft to to Perg, for instance, uh, for some advice as to how we can have a, an appropriate permissions model that 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 succeeds. Um, you know, the, the the manufacturer might learn some operational state in the locale. The locale might be linkable. Um, there may be devices where you definitely don't want to do this for. Um, where, where you might not want to leak, link, uh, leak the location of what you're doing, for instance. So we need to think a little bit about this. Um, and some of this information leaks naturally with MUD already just by retrieving a MUD URL. So it may be that there's less of a concern here than I'm thinking about, but I think we need some eyes on that. Um, and so my first question is, is there interest in this diagnostic reporting tool? Question of interest, there are a few hands go up. Uh, actually, a number of hands go up. How many okay. people have read this draft? See a few uh, fewer people. hands, but a few. Okay, so um, look, we, we have some nice heated debates at the IETF. I'm pretty sure we can have a couple on this one. Um, I think it's really interesting work, but it needs a lot of eyes to get it just right. I don't want to fast roll, I don't want to speed through this draft, but I suggest that the best way for this draft to be the best it can be is for two things to happen. Number one, we need manufacturers to look at it to make sure they're gonna get what they want out of it. Number two is that the, the IETF, this will require substantial cross area review um, in order to, to really be the right thing that comes out. Final, finally, one last point, which is, Whatever the manufacturers want to see, the deployment will want to see more. That is to say, you know, is, is my own deployment working appropriately? And so we probably want the draft to accommodate that use case as well. And in that context, one of the questions we will have, and there are privacy issues related to this as well, is who is the MUD manager? In the enterprise, this is an easy case. It's going to be something adjunct to AAA infrastructure, for an example. But in the home, it's a different kettle of fish. Is the MUD manager going to be Google? Is it going to be Amazon? Is it going to be uh, TELUS? Is it going to be Cablecom, Cable Labs? You know, so there's a, a, there are maybe privacy uh, considerations, even in the deployment. So I really do think we need a lot of eyes. And with that, I would just like to say, are there any questions about this work or comments? No one's coming up. Please do review, read this. Um, oh, I think Chin's going to make a comment. Not related to this question. Uh, this is Chin again. So can you give an update of the IoT MUD side meeting? I didn't see that. The IoT MUD side meeting, I don't know that I have time. Yeah, to, we're, to we're running uh, short on time. So if you want to send something, okay. a summary out to Ops Area Working Group list, that would be great. Yeah, we had a good, a good meeting. I'm happy to talk uh, uh, to you as well. Take care. Thanks. Um, next up, we have more MUD. Uh, Dan Wing will be presenting remotely. Dan, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. you hear you hear me over there? Yep, you sound great. So awesome. Yeah. Uh, so uh, go ahead. Yeah, so let's get started, please. Uh, so our, our goal, next slide, our goal for uh, this document is to extend MUD from what it's doing today to describe TLS interactions, so mostly the TLS handshake. Um, next slide, please. So what we're proposing is to extend it to look at the handshake. So the Cypher Suites offered, the Cypher Suite accepted, the SNI that is in the client hello, the server name and the certificate that are in the server hello. Um, and what the reason is uh, research has found and, and there's citations below uh, that there are mismatches between uh, what happens with malware and what happens with what we'll call legitimate software, especially running on things. 
uh, the things can be profiled and a MUD profile can be uh, published indicating what TLS parameters are normal for that uh, device to operate with, therefore helping to identify if that device has malware running on it. Uh, the characteristics that we found uh, in that research is malware does not uh, use the same crypto suites, does not connect to the same servers, to, you know, behaves differently than the legitimate software running on the device. Um, so that's that use case uh, on the left on, on this slide. And on the right, uh, we've also found situations where we can use the same technique to detect um, what I'm gonna call broken TLS. So uh, failures of best practices, such as validating the server certificate uh, expiration date, uh, things like that, um, which have been found in the wild uh, and we have we have uh, citations on, on the next slide on that, uh, and and reuse of the same private key uh, with uh, mutually authenticated TLS uh, as we we've seen in the wild. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, so the, the, there's a lot of reasons that the uh, software uses, uh, you know, the legitimate software running on the IoT device uses the same crypto suites all the time and the same parameters, and it's the same reasons that browsers do. Um, it's to uh, uh, you know make make code easier to run, uh, and because they are you know and use less footprint, and because they are constrained devices, they don't have all the memory that a PC does, so they need to use fewer crypto suites and have a, a constrained set of operations that they're using for their TLS uh, communications. Um, and we've profiled uh, a bunch of devices that uh, were easy to obtain and, and cheap and, and uh, everyone is familiar with, uh, Echo, uh, Kindle, a bunch of uh, Google devices, uh, and, and seeing how many different TLS profiles that they generate uh, following the Yang model that we've proposed. Next slide. Uh, and this is a, a bunch of the thing that we're proposing to uh, uh, examine and, and be part of the specification. Next slide. And a common question, of course, is TLS 1.3 encrypts a lot of what's in the handshake, so how valuable is, is this overall? And while it's true it doesn't encrypt the handshake, what is most valuable for us to get for the profiles uh, that we're interested in is what still remains in the clear with TLS 1.3. And that's all that I have. Next slide, please and hopefully earned you back some time. And if you have any questions, please uh, come to the mic or drop me an email. Questions on uh, this work? I think Elliot's coming up. Hey, Dan, how you doing? Doing all right, thanks. All right, so uh, nice draft. Uh, have, you, uh, have you tried implementing yet? <laughs> uh, been, do you have some code? Tiro at McAfee has implemented it, yes. Okay, very good. Um, Good, because I think one of the things we can do is uh, maybe get a couple of others to to, to join in on the, the the hackathon activities on this too to see if we can get a couple more implementations. But it sounds like a really great idea. I like the the general direction. Cool, thanks. Unfortunately, neither of us could attend IT this round. Uh, Benoit Clay, so uh, it's not specific about this draft, but uh, it seems that mud became something. <laughs> big recently, right? So we went from one RFC in Observable UG, and I was checking the, the MUD mailing list. Now there is like a, the hackathon, there is this uh, MUD maker, there is like seven documents here, right? And that, that led to the questions that were asked before, how does all this fit together? So, uh, you know, isn't it time to just create a working group or to combine this together? I mean, and I've not been discussing with people about it, but just thinking, you know, to me, when I, work, I want to get like a picture of everything of MUD, it's like a MUD mailing list, sometime an update absolutely G. There is a, the MUD maker, so, uh, you know, just throwing a stone in the pond to make people react. Uh, this thing working, actually, uh, I think that there's a uh, research group called uh, Sintusing IT, how MUD uh, uh, people coordinate with uh, Sintusing IT. All right, so occasionally uh, I've presented, oh, sorry, this is LA. Name, okay. uh, occasionally I've presented to T2TRG. Um, however, uh, this isn't really T2T. This is more T2N, right? The MUD never configures a device. MUD configures the network 
uh, infrastructure. And it's uh, it could be uh, it could be addressing more than just access control. I know we have a few concepts there, like uh, around this, but. Um, it, it is all focused on configuring the network and never communicating back to the device and never actually, and the device should never actually assume that the network is actually doing anything with this information because there might not be a MUD controller on the network. So um, it's a little bit of a different thing, but we do talk, absolutely. And uh, related to Benoit's question, um, and in the interest of time, I'll discuss this uh, via email more. Um, there's also captive portal discussions that have been happening on ops area uh, working group list. Maybe it is time to consider how, is MUD something to um, to centralize more uh, and, and make more uh, in its own realm versus, uh, versus an ops AWG, if that work is gonna continue to evolve. This is Elliot again. One question I have about it and um, you know, I don't mind if we work in a working group or if we work elsewhere. I think um, Warren was around for when we, we and Joel were, was around for a lot of the discussions around where we do all this work. And it, it was it's always one where you can split it multiple ways. However, um, one of the things I would like us to contemplate in this in, in the discussion that ensues is does it do we just cover mud? Do we cover some of the onboarding work that is going on related to mud? Like that so a lot of stuff's going on in Anima. Uh, some of the stuff that's going on in EMU, uh, there's discussion going on in ACME uh, around onboarding. There was uh, There's stuff that's been going on in Sixtish, which looks like it's about to close. Um, uh, there's a whole Anima architecture that's, or, 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 or it's not Anima is the wrong word, it's the 8366 voucher work that Kent and others did, which is being built upon. And then we need to look at how that works in on-prem. Should we, should we tie these into more of an onboarding working group or an IoT onboarding working group or should it just be MUD? And I'm getting these, this really ugly looking face from Warren. So maybe he, maybe yeah. you want to comment more, on that. More, more discuss, I, I think we'll move on, but I do think we should have this uh, broader discussion. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Our uh, next uh, presentation is also remote. How are you? Can you hear us? How you song? Can you hear us? Yes. Hello? Can you hear me? Can. Okay. And you are up. If you're talking, we can no longer hear you. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today I'm going to. Uh, talk about this uh, in situ flow information telemetry uh, framework. Uh, we have been talking about this um, uh, in two uh, meetings ago, um, and uh, then we also present this in IPPM uh, working group. Uh, but we still think uh, the OPS uh, AWG is a, a right fit uh, for uh, this uh, document, and uh, therefore uh, we are seeking for the uh, working group adoption for this eventually. Um, please go to the next slide. Uh, so the, the motivation uh, for this uh, um, document is uh, threefold. Uh, firstly, uh, there are currently uh, some uh, novel uh, data plane telemetry technology are emerging. Uh, in specific, they are so, uh, we call that on pass telemetry. Um, it involves several uh, uh, different uh, technologies. And uh, we, we think there is a need to actually classify uh, the terms uh, and the underlying techniques uh, so that we can have a formal understanding uh, about uh, those different technologies. And secondly, uh, these uh, techniques are very useful, uh, not only for the uh, data center and the uh, enterprise network, uh, we also see a strong interest from the uh, carrier operators to apply this kind of technologies uh, however, um, you know, uh, during our uh, prototyping and uh, deployment of this technology, we find there are uh, quite a few uh, challenges we need to address uh, before they can uh, uh, they can be uh, widely deployed in area networks. So we also want to um, provide an architectural framework uh, to um, you know summarize the challenges and uh, give a, uh, some. Uh, 
guideline for the future uh, standard devel development. So therefore, it's also uh, very important to continue to identify uh, any other uh, open issues. And uh, so uh, it is, uh, will be very helpful for us to continue uh, to develop, develop the, uh, the suite of uh, protocols. Next slide. Uh, yeah, so in previous uh, uh, RFCs, we have uh, uh, defined several uh, distinct type of OEM techniques. Uh, they are passive um, and active OEM. The passive uh, means um, basically you just uh, uh, filter, in, uh, filter or sample the user traffic and uh, use that to infer the performance of the user traffic. The active is uh, working on the opposite side. You uh, the Usually, you just uh, inject some uh, dedicated uh, OEM packets, uh, and you just measure those kind of uh, active probing packets uh, to get the uh, performance of the networks. Um, but this uh, new kind of on-pass uh, data plane telemetry techniques are, are different uh, from uh, either passive mode or active mode. So uh, we think we can call that a hybrid mode because uh, instead of uh, 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 just uh, capture the user traffic or inject a new packets, it uh, actively modify the user packet by adding metadata or instructions uh, to the user packet and therefore uh, collects those uh, direct uh, data from the user traffic to infer the uh, performance of uh, each user flows or the network. And uh, uh, below this hybrid mode, they can be further uh, uh, separate to two different type of underlying techniques. We call them uh, one is password mode, another is postcard mode. Right, password mode means uh, it's just basically uh, you uh, stamp the, the new data to the user packet and to each, uh, each hop on the following pass. Uh, so the representative uh, technologies, uh, uh, the IOM, trace mode, and the E2E mode, both uh, belong to uh, this category. And uh, in contrast, the postcard mode is uh, uh, different. Uh, it's uh, instead of uh, you know adding the uh, user data to the packet itself, it's just a, a directly uh, export data using a, a separate dedicated OEM packet. Uh, and the, 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 the user traffic will be uh, kept intact and uh, or, or it's just uh, carry some instruction but note the data itself. So, um, so we think uh, we can, uh, in this document, we can uh, clarify that this different type of uh, technologies. That will be one uh, contribution to uh, uh, complement uh, you know, the, the already defined um, terms for the OEM techniques. Next slide. Um, then uh, this slide summarizes several uh, challenges we, are, we, we, we already uh, uh, found uh, when, when we trying to deploy these technologies in carrier networks. The first one is uh, uh, related to the performance uh, because uh, it, uh, uh, this kind of techniques involve uh, quite a lot of data plane uh, processing. Uh, it will generate data or generate export packets. So sometimes it can have a direct impact on the uh, folding performance. Uh, we call that the observant uh, effect, uh, which call, uh, actually damages the fidelity of the uh, telemetry data. And also, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, intolerable to actually um, impact the folding performance. And on the other hand, the, as a export data, due to the uh, huge amount of exported data, the bandwidth consumption is huge. Also, those data will, may overload the processing servers will handle this kind of data. So this, uh, this uh, performance issues must be addressed to uh, allow this kind of techniques to be applied. And also we find the current uh, design, uh, current uh, standard proposals, uh, there are limited data flexibility and extensibility, uh, which means uh, it, can, it's quite, it can be useful to collect some predefined set of data. But, but uh, if we consider uh, to apply this in the wider uh, scope to support different network scenarios or uh, to, to collect different kind of uh, data or some even uh, user customized data, 
uh, that's uh, uh, this uh, standard proposal still uh, and cannot do that. So we need to extend the flexibility and the extensibility. And the last one is uh, deployment issues. Uh, because in carrier networks, there are so many different type of uh, uh, transport protocols. And there are uh, many uh, related work going on in ITF to, uh, uh, to talk about how you will encapsulate uh, such uh, 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 protocol headers, new headers into the different uh, protocols. So these are uh, very useful and uh, we need to continue that kind of work to try to cover uh, different kind of uh, uh, network scenarios and also we need to uh, consider uh, how to uh, handle the different tunnels uh, how to make this work in both underlying and uh, uh, or, or, uh, underlay and overlay networks so that's will be uh, very uh, important to clarify the, the technique uh, how to apply in tunnel mode next slide please Okay, so the, the high-level framework include uh, four uh, key components. The first one uh, is the smart flow data selection, which works at the, basically as a header node. Uh, it allow us to, uh, to define what kind of package or what kind of flow uh, we should actually enable this kind of uh, data collection uh, technique. Right, uh, there, there can be uh, different algorithm-based approaches uh, and uh, or some user-defined uh, uh, smart filters of this kind of uh, techniques are very useful to reduce uh, the load to the network. And the second component is uh, explore data reduction, uh, which means um, uh, when at every node, if it uh, ever need to uh, export data and uh, we can deploy some uh, event-based smart filters to actually reduce the amount of the data that need to be exported. So that's a very effective to uh, to reduce uh, data uh, bandwidth, also reduce the uh, load of the processing server. And the third component is, uh, covers uh, uh, all the encapsulation and the tunnel mode issues. So, so make it workable uh, in different uh, underlying uh, networks. So the last one is a dynamic network probe is uh, actually a very key components that can be used to support the previous three components uh, by uh, you know allow user to uh, define some uh, data uh, filtering or data selection policies uh, on the on the runtime. So uh, with these four components, we can uh, support uh, we can address the performance uh, deployability and flexibility issues we are facing in carrier networks. Next slide. Yeah, so uh, basically we want to take this uh, uh, opportunity uh, to have a more discussion with the working group. Uh, we want to collect more feedbacks uh, from the working group. Uh, so uh, apart from those have been covered in this document, we want to know, uh, is there any other challenges uh, for the carrier network data plane telemetry uh, we need to address? And also, um, uh, uh, what was missing in this uh, in this document? Uh, is there any suggestions to make the framework more complete? Uh, and we we are uh, we welcome any feedback on on this draft, and uh, uh, so we can uh, that can help us to improve this document, and uh, uh, we move it toward uh, the call for the working group adoption. Thank you very much. And any questions? Oh. Thank you. Uh, how, how you? We'll take one question, and then we have to take the rest of the list. Sure. Um, Shweta Sasko. Uh, I've gone through this draft a few times. It looks more like a, a white paper describing a solution, less like a framework. Um, it's a bit confusing on how who it is targeted towards and how to how to use it, including the the challenges, requirements that the framework is going to meet, and it has a bunch of references to to a whole lot of individual work, which have which are neither RFCs or uh, have been adopted yeah. yet. It looks more like the, the data that is collected here, which is useful, could be could be given as feedback to the existing drafts that are under work elsewhere, and and then revisit and see how do you how, how do you want to proceed with um, giving a, a, a operator feedback on how to use those uh, in-band telemetry uh, protocols that are going to be defined um, and some implementation guidance, but as a framework, it, it doesn't make much sense to me. Uh, 
I yeah, so, so the, the technique covered here are quite new as uh, they are all uh, RFC drafts, uh, uh, IETF drafts right now. And so this this document doesn't introduce any new techniques. It's uh, meant to be uh, informational. And uh, also uh, we want to collect uh, actually the feedback from operators uh, for their uh, uh, experience or the requirements for the deployment. So. Uh, we also want to provide a uh, best, uh, uh, you know, industry uh, practice, so that we can help the, you know, our uh, IETF to to continue uh, work on this uh, related techniques. Um, so uh, I think that's the main purpose of uh, this draft. Uh, doc documenting deployment experience would be useful, but that's not in there yet, and and there is a reference to. Um, algorithms that would make it better. Uh, there is reference to um, uh, on-box processing that would make it better without any concrete examples. I think those adding those would would make it useful. Yeah. Thanks. Thank and, and can uh, but uh, yeah, please uh, bring that up on the list so we can capture some of that. That was some, uh, as, as a contributor some of my feedback as well. Let's see if we can uh, push that out there. And uh, how you thank you again for presenting. Um, our last presenter. Um, is remote. Uh, Mickey, can you hear us? Mickey, are you there? Mikey, sorry. Mickey? Yep, he's coming to the mic. Can you hear me? Uh, we can. Okay. Uh, all you, uh, the, the quicker you can go through this, the better. Okay, so um, I wanted to talk about IOAM raw data export. So first, for those who are not that aware, um, IOAM or is in situ OAM is um, being progressed in the IPPM working group where there's a draft for a data plane um, uh, format that would go into packets. So essentially of packets traversing a network in a, in a domain and maybe at, at when the packets come into the domain, you start adding at every hop some network telemetry information. Um, and then when you get to the other end, you need to export that in some way um, out to a processing system that can do analytics or well, whatever type of monitoring you want. So this kind of complements all that. It's not about how you affect the normal data plane packets, but now that you've collected a bunch of information, um, um, how can we export that and what would we do with that? Um, next slide, please. So, so as I mentioned, IOM records operational and telemetry information um, um, in, in its initial form in the packet itself, um, though there are proposals to export directly from nodes as well. So in raw export, we're really saying that um, for a lot of the hardware switches and routers out there, they want to focus primarily on forwarding and you know just getting the data to its endpoint. It's very useful to collect this telemetry information, and that's what's new about IOAM. But we'd like to minimize the processing load and the difficulty of doing that within those nodes. And one way to do that is to um, do what we call raw export, which is kind of a, a minimal form of where you do as little processing as necessary to retrieve that IOAM data that's been collected and then export that in the simplest manner possible. So it, as you see in the figure on the right, the IOAM node is a switcher router that is just forwarding packets. Um, you do the, the raw export is then allowing to offload a lot of the uh, uh, processing or aggregation or reformatting to an IOM data processing system. So we're just trying to get the information off the IOM node as, as simply as possible. And then from that, it is possible that after that IOM data processing system, it may do some formatting or aggregation or processing. It may do some interpretation. And from there, you may have um, something else that's going to progress that to a monitoring or analytic system. So this is really focused on that first light blue arrow on the bottom for raw export of IOM data. It is not focused on the processed or interpreted or aggregated IOM data, 
which is something that um, could be addressed and might be valuable, but that's not what this draft is, is, is trying to do. Um, next slide, please. So as we look at, at raw export, we really want to get just the, the telemetry information and some packet fields as well. So we want to be able to identify the packet or the flow. And for that, we just, we're basically saying if you just take a chunk of the packet itself um, involving a bunch of the headers, then you can figure out what the packet is. Um, so as we looked at how we could do this, we found that IP fix is a possible answer. Um, um, IP fix is a generic export protocol. So while initially it was primarily used for um, counters and meters and things like that, the, um, there was a packet sampling framework to find and that exports chunks of packets. And we found that that is a pretty good match for what we want to do. And IP fix has these templates that allow you to construct um, fairly concise um, um, uh, packet formats or, or uh, uh, formats for the exported packets where you can add various fields um, that can help provide context and um, could include the IOAM headers themselves. Um, now, because we want to support this at you know billions of packets per second at kind of crazy line rates, um, it's likely that an implementation that's using IP fix for export of IOAM is going to do a small subset of what IP fix normally does. So we're not talking a generic, you know, define any template you want and go off and run with it. We're, we're talking about um, supporting a small number of, of templates that are rather fixed and, but the template can then describe uh, to whoever's receiving this, what that format is. Um, and it allows a fair amount of flexibility that different implementations uh, could use different um, uh, IP fix templates, which allow them to optimize and, and support it well in hardware. And the systems receiving them would do the more flexible, the full IP fix implementation, and they could interpret it um, with various formats coming, say, from different vendors or so on. Um, next slide, please. So there's a bunch of information elements that are already defined for packet sampling. So a section of an IP header or a section of a data link frame or ethernet. So some of those have been uh, def um, identified here. Next slide, please. So we're also proposing some new information elements uh, to provide additional context or tell you something about the IOM encapsulation type. The four on the bottom are the actual IOAM information. So you just take that chunk that's already defined in the IPPM drafts and just throw it in one in, in, in information element that you then include in IP fix. Uh, next slide, please. And then there are some examples. You don't have to follow these formats, but these are examples of how you might do things. So you might just have an IP header packet section with the IOM embedded within. Next slide. Um, or you could include the IOM in front in this example. Um, you have the IOM data and then a few other fields and then the packet section so you know which packet or flow it is. Um, next slide. Um, also, uh, we found some issues with alignment. So like four byte alignment is a big issue for a lot of hardware implementations. And when you have multiple, implementa multiple information elements, um, with the existing um, uh, IP packet section, um, if you have multiple information at once, it doesn't necessarily always have four byte alignment. So, propose some things to try to optimize that. Um, next slide. Um, let's go to the next one. Look at that offline. Next slide. So, um, so this has been presented in IPPM before, um, and the question is, as we look at these issues and, and try to define this and progress this, um, does this topic make more sense in OPSAWG or in IPPM? Um, there's no real home for IP fix at the moment, I believe. Um, 
So we're really asking um, if Ops AWG would be interested in progressing this work and soliciting technical input and feedback. How many people have read this draft? Only three hands and two of them are AD. Ah, a few more hands have gone up. Uh, is there interest in, uh, in doing this work in Ops AWG, this specific work around IP fix and IOAM? And we are, okay. Um, I think we'll take that to the list um, and ask that question there, Mickey. Um, thank you very much. We are uh, well out of time, so please do read this, all of these drafts, and come to the list and comment. And with that, in the last 30 seconds, um, I'm handing things over to uh, Ops Area for uh, our ADs. All right, Ignace McDonald's, before we, before we switch, uh, so uh, IPFIX has home in Ops AWG as basically a catch-all. The another option is that this might be an individual responsive document. If well, that's only well, this single single piece of work. Warren Kamari, um, also commenting on that. So I guess the big question is where do you think it'll get more review? Um, so far, it hasn't got a huge amount of discussion in Ops AWG. If you think it'll get more review in IPPM, then there's fine. But whatever people want. Um, if you want. Thank you, Mickey. Just ask, are, there are there any questions for the ops area um, directors? Open mic. Uh, with that then, unless uh, Ignis or Warren, you want to say any closing remarks? So one of the topics that was raised previously about uh, modern related work and where the home for that should be and uh, also similar activities in anima, possibly in security related working groups. Uh, does, the, does, does the audience think that they would like to discuss this? Uh, Elliot wanted, but he had to leave. Uh, so anyone else interested in this topic? All right, any comments about that? Uh, so MUD, the core of the MUD work is, seems to be done. Now there are extensions. Similar thing is happening with Bruski. Bruski is being processed, but there is now incoming work on, on what was called Bruski profiles, extensions, users, and other things. Uh, onboarding in general is a topic of interest for the community. The question is, how large is that community? Uh, do we need a, a central kind of a group for the, for the lack of a better word, which would coordinate that work? Or can that work be done fragmentedly in, uh, in different places where that is now? So your thoughts? Yeah, this is Chen Wu from Huawei. I, I think uh, for my work actually, yeah, I agree, there's a lot of uh, relevant effort uh, related to the IoT device management. Uh, it will be uh, good to have a, a single place to talk about this. Uh, and I also am, have been aware there's a home gateway, home net uh, working group. I'm not sure what's their scope. So since uh, uh, for this matter, a little bit cover a lot of the uh, you know security part, onboarding, brisky architecture is very complicated. I, cannot have the whole picture, so I um, uh, want to better understand the scope of this mud work. Yeah. And for me, Joe Clark, um, similar. Uh, I, I don't mind the, the mud work happening in Ops Area Working Group as a working group chair, but it sounds like, and there is, a lot of side meetings, other aliases, other areas where there's interest. It might make sense to centralize that, um, to give that community a, a, a more focused um, ability to progress this work. Okay. Yeah, the, I would direct your attention to the comment on the chat. 
um, from Darshak Thakur, who says, uh, I believe there's a lot of interest in onboarding, and yes, a single place or group would be nice. Home net is probably the wrong place. <laughs> so, um, I, you, yeah, I mean, I think you can interpret that how you want to. All right, thanks, thanks for relaying. The question that I would have from my side is, um, Having work spread in different places and grouped by topic probably results in the faster work on those components. Uh, if this becomes, uh, so if, for example, a new working group is established to kind of coordinate all of that work, uh, wouldn't that result in uh, a long but probably needed discussion on how to organize that on framework documents, on on kind of guidance and less focus on the actual shipping uh, products, uh, specifications. Is that is that of a concern for the community? Yeah, uh, this is Jimu again, actually. For this IoT related work, I want to see more IoT uh, Render or manager getting more like that. So it's uh, something we should uh, think about that. Yes, definitely. Uh, Benoit Clay, so one experiment, one thing we did in Ops in the past is that whenever we saw that we had like three or four documents in energy management, then a new charter was created by the AD to just create that, uh, that charter. Now, to come back to your question on are you going to go through the series of requirements and frameworks and everything, it just depends what the ADs will put in the charter, right? And I think that lately there was like an IG statement telling that we don't have to go through in sequence requirements and frameworks, and cetera. So you could just target and say, this is what this group is supposed to do. So this is your choice. Uh, would probably dis would not disagree with that, but uh, that's up to the working group actually trying to adhere to that and doing something. And well, we have a really good history of uh, overthinking about the problem space, uh, not necessarily for bad reasons, but that takes a really long time. So the question is, if, for example, there are only extensions in the pipeline for mud, Maybe it's more efficient to do that here, concentrated on, on mud. If there are extensions to Bruski, maybe it's more efficient to concentrate in anima to, to address those extensions. Uh, if we are thinking about the all-encompassing coverage from architectural point of view, yes, that's probably a new working group and maybe, maybe even more, but the question uh, at what time there will be some tangible deliverables out of that. Right, so um, we are out of time, but please raise those concerns to the mailing list. And please voice your opinion. This is not only well, for it is to think about that and then tell what to, for you to do. This is for you as a community to decide what you want to do. As well, uh, blue sheets, if you haven't signed them, I think they're floating around in the back of the room. Please uh, sign them on your way out. And thank you very much. And thanks. Yeah. I actually suggested, suggested to...